This is the BioCentury Show. The BioCentury Show is brought to you by the second BioCentury Bay Helix East-West Biopharma Summit. Join us October 2nd to 4th in Kendall Square to debate how to globalize biopharma innovation to benefit patients and achieve an ROI for investors. Hello and welcome to the BioCentury Show. I am Simon Fishburne, Editor-in-Chief at BioCentury. I am absolutely delighted today to be joined by Nubar Afayan, founder and CEO of Flagship Pioneering, and of course, co-founder and board chairman at Moderna as well. Nubar, most people know you by Nubar, has built over 70 life science and technology startups, often at the leading edge of science. Flagship was an early mover in the microbiome, for example, and of course, where a lot of the recent recognition has come from in mRNA. Nubar has also been vocal about the importance and contribution of immigrants to economic and scientific progress. And I am going to stop there because I could probably go on with accolades all day. So I'm going to start with a welcome to the show. Nubar, this has been an extraordinary few years for the world, obviously, but also for our industry. And you, of course, with Moderna, have been in the eye of that storm. Hopefully, the storm has mostly passed, we'll see. And I wanna ask you what you see as the enduring lessons from the pandemic from a prevention and treatment point of view. Great, well, thanks Simone for having me uh, with you. It's always a great pleasure to to have a chance to reflect on things instead of deal with the urgent and the the immediate. Um, Yeah, I I think the last few years have been quite a period of testing of what biotechnology is really all about and the impact it can have. And and I think that it's fair to say that when that moment came, both on the diagnostic, on the treatment, and most notably on the vaccine side, the the immense amount of science that's been invested in, the translational work and the platform creation that our industry does so well, really rose to the challenge and things that people felt would be inconceivable, uh, were in fact not only conceivable, but but actually done with, with, with some effect. And I'm I'm really proud broadly of the industry and uh, the piece, the past 40 years, at least that I've been in and around it, uh, as opposed to just the kind of one bit of contribution that Moderna and we made. Um, I think in terms of lasting lessons, um, I think it's kind of early yet to to figure out how that's going to play out, um, because uh, you know we're in this period where we're kind of rebounding from being in the thick of it to running away from it as fast as we can, and unfortunately, in the process, we are quite predictably forgetting faster than we can remember right. things, and and that's too bad. I'm holding out for a rebound not a rebound in the virus and the pandemic, <laughs> but a rebound in, in people's recognition that if we don't take meaningful lessons out of this, it will have been a real waste of a fairly traumatic experience in the human condition. I mean, you know, the official numbers are like six, seven million people died. Reality is that there's about 20 million unexplained yeah. deaths during that period. 20 million people dying is like a pretty major war. And the notion that we take no lessons out of the war, in my view, is a really uh, 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 unfortunate regression of the human condition. So I, for one, think that those of us who have some of the experiences to relate need to keep it alive long enough that the receptivity to it uh, grows. And, And I suspect that it will. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's probably this sort of balance between wanting not to be all about the pandemic anymore, wanting to be able to invest in other things, and yet probably still needing to nurture. I mean, you the technologies have taken over, but you know, you still want to um, nurture the kind of programs that hopefully uh, can move things to a position where we wouldn't be starting from step zero next time. So that brings me to something that I I know is 
a term, I don't know if you coined the term or if you just have been a big proponent of it, and that is health security. I know that's a very important concept. You and I talked about it, in fact, a couple of years ago. Maybe let's start by asking, what do you mean by health security and how is flagship engaged in that enterprise? Yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, as, as most terms, you know, even if you try to coin it, you can always find prior uses of it. But it turned out that our use of it was quite different than what it had been used for before. And let me explain how we think about it. So several years ago, actually, even before the pandemic, we started getting interested in this notion of whether uh, the science that we all work on, which is the detection and treatment of disease, and aspirationally the cure of disease, could somehow be moved upstream of a disease condition. And so that all the molecular science and very precise approaches to intervention that we've been developing for as drugs and vaccines could not move way upstream of disease. Of course, vaccines are often used upstream right. of disease, but, but drugs are not. So in that process, we realized like, why isn't this happening? And of course you realize that you know, the FDA regulates you as a drug only if there is a disease. Um, the reimbursement isn't completely unclear. If you don't have a disease condition, how are you gonna get anybody to pay for it? So pretty much everywhere you look, you realize that the system, you know, medical school isn't teaching you actually what to do upstream of disease. They're teaching you what to do out downstream of disease. So we kind of started realizing that, and I'll say this in a nutshell, that what we, what we call healthcare is actually not really healthcare, it's sick care. And that's, right. that's kind of an interesting marketing euphemism that's been developed over the years. And so if you if you realize, you know, how do you actually do true healthcare, you've got to think about prevention or what we increasingly viewed as preemption of disease. Could be delay, for example. You know, if you give somebody a choice of living three more months with diabetes or getting diabetes diagnosed two years later or having it two years later, which would they pick? Well, I think most people would pick two more lives without a particular disease, two more years. But, but of course, you don't, we don't do anything to effectuate that. In fact, one of the things we realize in our research is that, for example, a country like the UK, which is quite comprehensive about how they think about healthcare, two and a half percent of their budget for health goes into anything upstream of disease. So 97 and a half cents goes into things that, that follow disease. So the notion of health security then as a terminology was for me born out of this, this was again pre-pandemic, was this notion of if we only thought about our health as a matter of security, the way we think of our physical status as a matter of uh, security, then we would demand, like we do from our government's physical security against crime, against terrorism, against uh, any number of dangers, we would expect the same for our health. And, and if we treated it that way, then boy, would the emphasis change to all, not genetic predispositions only, that's kind of like the earliest of early, but everything downstream that precedes a disease. So we thought, why not think of it as a security measure? Why not think of it as protecting health, preempting the condition of disease? And, and now, of course, the pandemic brought that to a lot of people's attention. And so today, you may know in the UK, for example, there is an agency for health security in the US, they have different commissions. So I think it's gonna be over time, more and more a hybrid issue, somewhere between healthcare and health security. Let me just drill into it for a minute. I mean, I can think of very few, I admit, but I don't know if medications like um, statins or something that is really just changing your risk of getting disease later sort of fits in this paradigm. But outside of that, and, and maybe a few other examples, we know, especially that the reimbursement industry or the, sorry, the, um, the insurance industry has been very loath to actually pay for preventive treatments for diabetes, so lifestyle or, you know, things like that. So what are your actual activities? Are you engaging with different sectors and trying to get them on board or are you actually in or both <laughs> are you sort of involved in developing interventions that will work upstream so i would say you know i think it's going to take both because i worry that the bits and pieces that have been done that could reasonably uh, uh, fit into this category 
away from vaccines, and let me come back to vaccines in a minute, are kind of really uh, not heavily driven by the scientific process of actually quantifying the pre the pre-disease condition and then going after people who really you could show statistically you can make a difference for. So you know, if it takes 25 years to demonstrate that something you're doing reduces risk, uh, nobody's going to invest in it uh, uh, anytime soon. And so that that's been an impediment. So what we're trying to do is say, okay, of the universe of things we could do, which ones might lend themselves to a shorter time frame? So for example, we have a project where we are identifying initially clinical kind of electronic medical record derived markers, and then eventually now we're doing biomarkers to detect uh, a, a NASH uh, condition uh, before a diagnosis. And moreover, to kind of say, okay, this person is within 12 months of getting a diagnosis, this person is within two years. If we could make that segmentation and then go after a cohort that's say within a, a year uh, and show that we can delay that by a year or two years, the economic impact of that, the health impact of that, I think is measurable. And the question will be what interventions can do that? And what we're finding in that particular project, which we haven't talked about publicly before, it's one of our internal uh, uh, activities. What we're finding is that the early, early manifestations of the pre-disease condition look nothing like the later stage disease. The pathways are different. The targets are different. Therefore, what we've also found is that certain treatments that people thought would work in later stage NASH actually might well work in pre-NASH conditions. And so we're actually trying them for that. So that's one example. Another example is we've got a, a project called Harbinger, which is Harbinger Health, which is developing a blood-based cancer diagnostic tool that actually at, 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 at a circulating markers, but as opposed to doing just kind of statistically derived markers the way there are current companies that do, we actually found a very clear biological signature that if in fact you find in DNA that's circulating, there is a very high correlation with cancer of all types, but it's biologically derived. It's not statistically derived. Now you might say, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is at least in our hands so far, we're being able to use this to detect very early stage cancer early. And you might say, well, what is, how does that work? Well, the current circulating uh, a tumor marker tests are all detecting later stage cancer early. In other words, it hasn't been diagnosed and you're doing a population screen and you're saying you have stage three, stage four cancer. But what you'd really like to do is to find stage one cancer. And this biological marker set, we believe, does that. Now, why does this relate to our discussion? We're taking another step and saying, could we find stage zero cancer? Well, what's stage zero Before cancer? Before the biological pathways have kicked in to... To deem it a cancer by any other measure. Right, right, and so, right, right. And so you might say, well, geez, now what are you going to do with that? Well, there's a whole armamentarium of relatively safer cancer treatments you could try. But then before you say, Nana, this cannot happen, it can't be, think of what a polyp is. What is a polyp in a colonoscopy? It is a precancer. What do we do with it? We remove it. Is there any proof that that polyp is going to become cancerous? No. But do we want to risk it, given the high correlation between a polyp and, and, and a more advanced cancer? There's enough of a correlation that we go, you know what? Get rid of it. Imagine molecular polyps for every disease. That's what we think we can develop. Now, you asked, what are we doing as flagship? On the one hand, we're trying to construct these demonstrations. And on the other hand, we're beginning to talk to payers and regulators, et cetera, not just in the US, but also overseas where the, the system is somewhat different to see where some of the early adopters may be. No, but we're going to take a very brief break. And after that, we're going to come back. We're going to talk more about biotech and more about risk. Emerging biopharma companies in the US, Europe, and Asia face the same dilemma. How do you globalize to deliver innovation to patients and reward investors? A handful of biopharma companies will build global operations. Most will achieve global economics through partnering and licensing. Others will capture a share of the economics by enabling global development and financings. This October in Kendall Square, BioCentury and Bayhelix once again bring together decision makers and investors to address these industry challenges 
and to form trusted cross-border relationships. Register today at biocentryeastwest.com. Hi again, back at the Biocentury show with Flagship's Nubar, a fan. Nuba, before the break, we talked, you raised the issue of risk and you talked about some pretty innovative ideas. Now, I know that you're kind of a big thinker in this area, and I want to talk a little bit more about biotech as an industry, where on the one hand, I feel like, you know, this is the center of risk, right? That, you know, people take bets, investments on fairly edgy ideas. They take a long time to come to fruition. And, you know, risk is at the center of what we do. On the other hand, a lot of things take a lot of time to change. We really haven't changed the amount of time that it takes to bring a drug to market outside of what Moderna and uh, colleagues did during the pandemic. But on the whole, we haven't changed that trajectory. We haven't changed the clinical trial paradigm. And we certainly, you can argue, drug pricing has gone in the wrong way. So what are your thoughts about disruptors to this? And, you know, are, are we as an industry willing to take different kinds of risks in how we disrupt how we how we do or make drugs from, you know, idea all the way? Well, look, and that's I've, I've been I've been at this for 36 years now uh, as an entrepreneur and, and innovator, and it is the, the frustrating part of being in this industry because uh, it's hard enough that you're dealing with uh, science and the and the risks involved in science, let alone in human physiology and showing an effect in humans. But there's also a mindset that things have to take this long. The only way to do them safely if they take forever. And we make it harder and harder for us to actually show the impact of what we can do. And interestingly, during the pandemic, a force majeure, an external factor, had us just for a little while <laughs> do something that, <laughs> that was absolutely as rigorous as any other vaccine development has ever been, 30,000 subjects just in our trials, similar uh, numbers with others. And, 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 and we developed a highly efficacious vaccine that by any measure should not have been possible based on what people in our industry believe and we're espousing to on CNN and everywhere else. The fact that that can be done and it's not existence proof that we should absolutely dare to do things differently. The fact that it's okay for people to get sick and have difficult lives, let alone die, and that we stick to that as the norm, you know, is 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 something that I that I lament, frankly. And it sounds it sounds grandiose to say this, but but you know, we're you you know, obviously, when you get to be my age, you start thinking, how much time do I have left? And you want to have impact, and it just seems like you know we're all in the slow lane, and 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 I and I do hope. Now, of course, there's always technologies around the corner. The two that I think may well have an impact is on the one hand, the programmability of medicines. You know, the whole new generation of medicines, whether it's RNA-based or DNA-based or even protein-based nowadays, can be programmed. That didn't used to be the case. So, you know, if you've got 10 years to do something, you don't exactly think about doing it reproducibly quickly. As so you just kind of say, okay, whatever, I'll keep trying trial and error. Now that's changing. And then, of course, the, the, the advent of data-driven algorithms that can give us much better sense of how to navigate the uncertainty of testing in humans using real-world evidence, using all sorts of other things, and segmenting people, that was also not possible. Now, if you put a gun to my head and said, do you think that will make a huge difference? I can't guarantee it, but boy, do I hope something will. And the question will be, will the regulators increasingly gain confidence that you regulate one-off drugs differently than when you're just changing a few bases and you have a completely new drug. We saw that during the, the pandemic as to how the FDA looked at the, the, the 1273 mRNA and then followed by the additional versions we made for variants. And nowadays with a new seasonal one, we're changing programmatically at a computer the sequence and then the one that hopefully will be available relatively shortly here for the new season, we're not making it in, 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 in eggs and 
and chickens and the like, we're literally synthesizing whatever strain we want, and we're not going through a start from scratch kind of trial, we're showing equivalence, etc. Imagine that in cancer, and it will be possible in cancer as we use RNA for cancer vaccines. Imagine that in other diseases. So I, you know, I, I think that kind of humans are essentially hopeless optimists, uh, and, and we have to be for health. Done in our industry, right? In our industry. And I think there's enough, an optimist has enough reasons to stay optimistic in this regard. A pessimist usually people who invest in biotech kind of who take advantage of this volatility will kind of find all sorts of reasons to say it'll never change. And, you know, the jury will be out. All right. Um, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions, a, a short one that's a follow-up to that. You sort of went down the um, data science route. And I, I want to ask you, I know a lot of industries, I mean, our industry has a ton of data, right? We, we're sitting as an industry on an enormous wealth of data. And there are other industries where, you know, AI can be very disruptive in a good way, uh, a positive disruptor. So my real question to you is, do you think that can happen in our industry, even from drug development to business operations, you know, the commoditization, the sort of fact that generative AI and machine learning is just going to become fairly routine or commonplace, um, even as a skill set. Does that have an opportunity to really change the trajectory in drug development? Inevitable. One word, inevitable. And, and the reason it's inevitable is because what people don't realize is that most of the uses of AI outside of life science are in things that are human-generated systems. Traffic, you know, transportation, you name it, logistics, et cetera. These are complex human-generated things. It, we're dealing with non-human generated things. That is life, that is nature. And our ability as humans to understand and control what happens in nature is frankly limited by our intelligence. No amount of, of data measurements and, and theory is gonna allow us to be able to actually represent in its complexity what nature already has developed. So the only chance we have is to what I would view as is to use augmented intelligence. And augmented intelligence, AI, is essentially what people are calling artificial intelligence. There's nothing artificial about it. Humans have been inventing tools to enhance their pro productivity and their capability for a long time. This is more of that. There are people who want to think about AI as a replacement for humans. Well, you know, last I checked, there are some things that technologies we've previously developed, computers, cars, have also replaced humans. But at the end of the day, uh, it's just part of a continuum as we, as we go forward. And, and it's important to understand that in our industry, it's inevitable because we don't have the mental capacity to actually figure this out. I mean, just think about it for a minute. I don't think people have realized just how uniquely applicable and disruptive AI can be to what we do at the science level, and then, of course, clinical development and, and you name it, every aspect of the complexity. And that is, you know, we, we're dealing with a cell that has tens of thousands of distinct components, if not more, that interact in thousands of ways among each other, yeah. dif distinct ways. Now, you tell me a paper written 100 years from now or 1,000 years from now, in which human communication are we going to be to explain something that requires 10,000 things interacting in thousands of ways to explain, right? This cell divided because, and then I have to now tell you about, whereas a computer can do that in various ways already, a bit poorly compared to tomorrow, but in a way that can get better and better. And I, I think it's inevitable. Nubar, I want to move from there to a question of innovation funding. You and I talked a couple of years ago, actually, I looked at the date, it was June, 2021. And at that time, we were talking about the massive amount of capital that there was in biotech. The tables have turned a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I want to spend a couple of minutes on our ecosystem and about innovation. So I think you and I have just talked about the tremendous amount of biology and technology in the last decade. There's, you know, I think it's unparalleled, you know, in, in my mind. Um, but a lot of people do feel there's been a lot of redundancy when it comes to company creation. Um, how are you looking at the landscape in biotech 
right now and, and how you think it's going to unfold in the next few years? You know, I, I've always viewed the entrepreneurial process as a human equivalent of Darwinian evolution. And the notion that you could look at a natural ecosystem and say, nah, there's too many bacteria here, or there's too many you know, uh, plants here, is a conceit that only analysts can have of an industry. It's not at all a reasonable point of view. The right. reality no, no company is, is going to sit there saying there's too many. I must be the one to fall on my sword, I, you mean? I, I, yeah. or, <laughs> or look, essentially economic forces, availability of capital, there's a limit to how much loss people can take, uh, is going to go through various waves. By the way, interest rates being a massive uh, 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 influence over that, the reason that that money is not flowing as much into biotech in some ways has to do with just the cost of capital and the alternative right. investments they could make for the kind of risk that we represent. If the interest rate is zero, you're going to want to expose yourself to risk and kind of play for the upside, but at, at higher and higher interest rates. So I say that only because you can't ignore that, just like in nature, if the, if the planet gets 10 degrees warmer, the, the ecosystem experiment's going to change. I can assure you, you can sit there as the best you know, species you want, and all of a sudden, you're now at a competitive disadvantage. So I've always viewed it as kind of natural, uh, a Darwinian selection process. And yeah, it's a, it's a cruel way to make progress. And, and, and I think I've always, look, I, you know, this may, this may uh, uh, just simply indicate that I'm, and I'm old, but I just don't think that this has much to do with who's got the best idea, uh, who's got the best team. This has also to do with the fact that, you know, it, how, how much of a lead do you have? How early are you? If you're too early, you may get extinguished because nobody understands what you're saying. If you're too late, you will be commoditized because a hundred people want to do CAR-T trials and a thousand people want to do gene therapy trials. And there's nothing you can do about it as an entrepreneur. You have to look at that landscape and say, do I want to go to the center of it where it's commodity? Or do I want to go to the edges where I have risk of being the, the one left out? And, and that dynamic will change. And as soon as somebody says, okay, all of a sudden RNA works, then a thousand people come that way. And you better be a, kind of doing something different if you want to keep pushing and pioneering and that that's so i i don't all these pundits who kind of say you know flight to quality pruning of our industry this is not they're describing a natural phenomenon they're not describing a rational one in my opinion um you talked uh, about the entrepreneur and i want to end with a, a slightly different question you have been very vocal and erudite talking about the role of immigrants in innovation. You're an immigrant. I'm an immigrant, at least America. And, uh, um, you know, you've got a lot of recognition and commendation for this. I want to ask you two questions, which I'll roll together. Um, so what do you see as the principal issues today regarding immigration? And why has it been such a priority for you to speak out about it? Well, so first of all, I've been called worse things than erudite, so thanks for that. Uh, but, but I'll have to remember that. I'm kidding. Um, look, I think, so, you know, I, you know that several years ago, the, this country was increasingly, at least in some quarters, hostile towards the immigration, the very immigration process that made this place great. And, you know, I remember very clearly imprinted in my memory banks is an experience I had when I was 20 years old and I came down to go to MIT to do my PhD and I walked down what's a famous infinite corridor there and on the wall was the a, a, a picture of an Indian chief pointing out saying who are you calling foreigner pilgrim right and for a place like MIT that is filled with foreigners the notion that we're all foreigners was something that stuck with me I didn't affect me at the time but then over the years, I realized that interestingly, all innovation is, all entrepreneurship is, is just intellectual immigration. Because you leave the comforts of home, you leave the comforts of knowing the culture and the laws and the behaviors, and you put yourself in the middle of nowhere, often made fun of, often kind of your accents made fun, et cetera. It's the same thing. 
And if you can do that, then you create a new place and then other people move into where you created a civilization as opposed to where they were. And then I realized over time, more recently, that that you know that physical immigration that many of us have experienced is an interesting prelude to intellectual immigration because you've at least experienced it in your life and you know what it is to kind of survive on the one hand, the conditions, and then try to thrive, either getting education, giving opportunities. This is a country that does that really better than anywhere on the planet. And yet several years ago, political wins made this a, a political topic where immigration was being discouraged, refugees were being treated as kind of extreme immigrants in a very poor way. And I thought that being a beneficiary of this journey, looking around at 50%, 60% of the startup leadership in certainly unicorns in the West Coast where the data is pretty good, being driven by immigrants, that if we cut that off, we absolutely make this country a much worse place economically and for that matter, culturally and diversity wise. So I thought I have a responsibility to at least make that point. Um, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not involved in politics, but I certainly believe that that is, that is short-termism of the highest order. Uh, I think this is a country that's based on regeneration and the regenerative power of this industry is on the one hand education, of this country is on the one hand education and the other hand immigration. Well, that is a great way to end this. It is always a pleasure to talk to you. And thank you for your very insightful comments. Thanks, Nubar. Thank you, Simone. Thank you. The BioCentury Show is brought to you by the second BioCentury Bay Helix East-West Biopharma Summit. Join us October 2nd to 4th in Kendall Square to debate how to globalize biopharma innovation to benefit patients and achieve an ROI for investors.